It's six past midnight. All is dark. All is not as it seems. Six tales of intrigue, of mystery, of horror and terror. Each different, and yet each compelling in their own way. Dare you spend the next half hour with me, my dear friends? <laughs> I do so dearly hope so. Well, you know what time it is. It's Friday. The weekend is ahead of us. So sit down with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. Perhaps if Martin had gone to church more often, this wouldn't have happened. He'd still have died, of course. But don't we all, eventually? What Martin didn't get, however, was the privilege of going into the fabled shining light. He didn't even know he'd died at first. He'd just been sitting in his recliner, watching quality television over his bulging paunch, when he felt a pain in his chest. Everything went black for a moment, then everything went back to normal, or so he thought. He could still see the TV screen and hear the goings-on of his show. He just felt a little numb. It wasn't until he tried to reach for his bottle of beer that he realized he couldn't move. He didn't register at first, but after about 30 seconds of forced immobility, he started to panic. He wanted to scream, on the off chance that his bitter nag of a wife or his failure of a son would run in to help him, but his tongue and fat lips wouldn't move. Besides, neither of them were home. What felt like hours rolled by, and Martin's panic skyrocketed. How long would it be until he got help? Would he get help? Would he even be found? His wife was still out on one of her marathon shopping sprees, and Mike, the all-round disappointment of a son who just wouldn't leave the family home, despite all the subtle and not-so-subtle hints, dropped that he needed to get a job was probably outspending what would have been his college fund if he hadn't dropped out of high school on his new favorite drug addiction. What if he was stuck like this forever? Despair filled Martin's plaque-clogged heart. He wasn't getting any better. If anything, he finally clued in that something was deeply wrong when he saw his chest wasn't moving. Well, crap. This wasn't how he thought death would be. Where were the fluffy clouds and the sickeningly happy harp-plucking angels? Or, more realistically, the firing and suffering of eternal damnation. Somewhat worried, Martin deeply pondered this for a while, occasionally breaking from his train of thought to ogle the bouncy blonde on the grainy TV screen. His distress, or more accurately, apathy, eventually soured into impatience as the hours rolled by. His show had long since ended, and had been replaced by a slew of infomercials and products that would give you your hair back in 30 days or less, or trim that belly fat down to nothing in five months while saving you money. Call now and receive. Martin heard the front door open. <gasps> he felt hope. Maybe, if his wife found him, She'd scream and cry and prove that, after everything that had happened between them, she still loved him. Oh, blast. It was just Mike. Martin doubted many men could get disappointed by their sons after they'd gone and kicked the bucket. Mike finally found Martin limply spread over his dirty easy chair, cold and blue, and bearing an uncanny resemblance to a beached whale. Possibly high, he screamed like a little girl. In no time at all, the police, the doctors, and Martin's wife crowded the dingy house. Martin listened as Mike blubbered incoherently, and Joni tearfully, yet somehow bluntly, told everyone there had just been a matter of time before our tubby hubby's heart would give out. Martin was actually happy. He'd been able to make her cry, after all. Not that that was a good thing. What he meant was, he would have scowled if he could have as someone turned off the TV. Hey, infomercials were better than nothing. He heard grunting and struggling beneath him. 
and realized some EMTs, or whatever they were called, were trying to lift him onto a gurney. That was just insulting. He couldn't have been that heavy, could he? As they pulled the white sheet over Martin's head and hauled him away, Martin chided himself over being self-conscious over his weight, <laughs> despite being dead. Martin had always hated hospitals, but morgues were even worse. He lay on a slab of what he assumed was cold metal, completely naked. He tried to think positively as his skin turned ever paler. He then saw the coroner, and more importantly, the coroner's knife and other tools. He was positive he was going to get cut open. The man hummed to himself as he ran a blade down Martin's chest. It was cold, flabby skin sagged a little as it was parted revealing pinkish inners that Martin didn't know or want to know that he had. Oh, Martin wanted to cry. He screamed inwardly as the man began scooping and pulling out organs that glistened wetly in the pale, fluorescent light. He felt horrible pain, just looking at them even though he felt nothing physically. He pleaded for them to be returned as his long coil of intestines was snaked out of his body. He knew it was futile when the coroner wrapped his hand around his cold, dead heart and pulled. Holding it in his hands and looking down on it, the coroner shook his head and tut 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 it before returning to his grisly task, humming all the while. Martin tried to focus on that bouncy TV blonde during all the sucking, slurping and slicing. It didn't quite work like he'd wanted it to for some reason. After his organs were opened, prodded and examined, they were patched back together and returned to Martin's chest cavity, more or less in the right order. Once Martin had been thoroughly violated and stitched back together like a fleshy scarecrow, he was taken from the table and shoved into a dark morgue shelf. Martin just wanted to be buried and be done with it. Why did his wife have to drag things out like this? Relatives he didn't even know had shown up, crowding around his open casket and bawling. Neither of his two daughters were there, one because of out-of-the-country college work, the other presumably out of spite, even though she was on vacation. Martin inwardly cringed as one person he didn't recognize got tears and spittle onto his black suit, the last one he would ever wear, one he'd wear for the rest of his death. Though he couldn't move his head, he could see the crowd part a little. He saw his wife, her weathered face slick and red with tears under her black veil, approach his casket. He felt a little bit happier and remembered their time together. Their honeymoon had ended too soon. He then saddened as he went over the flaming wreck their marriage had become. He'd taken to drinking not long after his youngest, Becky, was born and Joni started spending money she knew they didn't have. Their arguments were vicious and often lasted for hours, shouting matches that ended only when their throats were too hoarse to scream. By the time Becky went to college and Mike moved back in, they'd stopped talking almost entirely, sharing the same house but leading separate lives. Why didn't she just leave him? He never knew. He regretted everything, Fighting with his wife in front of their kids, letting himself go, Gosh, all the bottles he'd downed. When he finished reminiscing, he realized Joni was looking him right in the eyes. He wanted to cry, to say sorry for everything, but fell silent when she started whispering. Ah, oh, if only those doctors had known what they should have been looking for, Marty. The lid of the casket closed before he understood. We'll be back in a few hours, said the girl's parents as they closed the door. She hadn't moved from the cold, hard wood floor. She could do anything. Well, what does she want to do? She gazed outside to see the autumn leaves in the sky of a dark shade of blue. 
Hmm, a horror movie would be nice, she thought. She dropped herself upon the couch and turned on the TV to see the face of a person dead and of rot. It made her jump, but she laughed at the face, for it had been a cheesy movie. By now it was dark, and she placed her hand down by her side to pet her dog. Well, at least she wasn't lonely. The dog licked her softly, brushing its sandpaper-like tongue across the palm of her hand. She got bored of the movie, so she flipped to the next channel to see what was there. Another called Steakland. She watched the film for about 30 minutes until she got bored again. She placed her hand down to her dog and, once again, it licked her hand. She wanted to feel adored. Flipping towards the lower channel, she passed upon the news and was chilled by the report. Madman escapes from psychiatric hospital. Stay indoors. And then the power went out and the news was cut short. She got scared, so she ventured around the house, locking all doors and windows, closing the previously left open windows in her basement and the one in her bathroom. For all that she had been scared, like a cat out of its skin in the old cartoons when it would see a ghost, she was also stricken by the sense of impending doom. From running around the house like a madman herself, she had gotten exhausted. She was not one for sports or the such. She went to the faucet in the kitchen and grabbed a glass, filling it with cold water, almost over the top, but not too much. She turned off all the lights going up to her room. The house was pitch black, and she carelessly stumbled into her room blindly. She fell onto her bed and called for her dog, and it came shuffling into her room, bumping into things in the dark as well, and it again licked her hand kindly. The girl laid on her bed, slowly drifting into sleep, her body and head feeling weightless, and began to spin, until she heard a drip, drip, drip. She knew if she left the water on her parents would be mad, so she carefully moved in the dark so she wouldn't trip. She walked down the hallway, almost to the stairs passing up the bathroom, almost to the stairs passing to the bathroom, when she heard a drip. She was confused as to why the water had been running in there. She turned around and walked to the bathroom, flipping on the light swiftly and with care. When she flipped the switch on, she was bewildered to see that the faucet was indeed not leaking, so she suspected it was a shower faucet. She pulled the curtain away, and what laid in the tub nearly made her vomit. The bloody mess that awaited her was her very own hound, and what was written in its blood made her nearly drop to the ground. And what was written on the bathroom's wall of Milchew? Humans can lick too. I woke to the shrill wail of a siren. At first I was filled with confusion, which solidified into disbelief, which blazed into flat-out panic. I shook Susie awake, screaming that we needed to grab the kids and get out of here. She stared at me for a moment. Then she too heard the siren. The ground shook beneath us and orange light flooded the windows. She tried to argue that we needed to stay here and hunker down, but I knew duck and cover would not save us. I barked out that I'd start the car and she should get Chrissy and Wes. We both flew out of bed. I scrambled on bare feet out of our room and down the stairs, while Susie rushed to get the kids. As I tore through the unlit garage and onto the rough driveway, the soles of my feet getting covered with black dust, I landed on a nail or something else sharp, but I didn't feel any pain. The car door was locked and I didn't have the keys. Of all the times for me to lock them in the car. I cursed and slammed a fist into the window. Then I ran back into the garage and over to my tool chest. <sighs> Where? I hissed, throwing screws and nails out by the fistful, until my hands finally wrapped around a good, solid hammer. I sprinted back over to the car and smashed the window, sending shards of glass 
everywhere. The car alarm screamed bloody murder along with the sirens. Susie! I shouted as I thrust my arm inside the cabin and fumbled with the keys. I did not have time for this. I looked up and saw my wife in the doorway, still in her nightgown, with Chrissy bawling in her arms and Wes fearfully clinging to her leg, a wet spot growing in the crotch of his Captain America pajama pants. I felt the keys click and the engine roared to life. Come on! I screamed at them as I flung the door open and threw myself inside. Susie looked at me, pleading then practically shoved Wes into the back and eased her way into the passenger seat next to me. I didn't give her time to close the door behind before I floored the gas pedal, its grooves burying themselves into my foot, and the car sped in reverse, the squeal of its tires adding to the hectic cacophony. Daddy, what's going on? Wes wailed as we sped out of the neighborhood. Susie said something, but I couldn't understand her. And I couldn't take my eyes off the... The night sky lit up around us, bathing everything in blinding orange light. My eyes temporarily blinded, I nearly veered off the road as my family screamed. The ground under us shook as a deafening boom roared. When I was able to see properly again, I almost started crying when I saw the fiery mushroom-shaped cloud in my rear-view mirror. We drove for what felt like an eternity. I didn't know where we were going, where we could go. Half death, I shouted for Susie to turn on the radio to maximum volume. I could just barely make out something about Soviets in a state of national emergency. We weren't ready. Whistles off in the distance drowned out the rest for me. I saw more clouds swell in the distance. Then my eyes happened upon the fuel gate whose needle ticked to the farthest left possible. Our sedan slowed down, then finally stopped. What was I thinking? I should have listened to Susie. You can't outrun a bomb. I looked first at Susie and Chrissy, then at Wes. I'm so sorry. I love you. Just behind me, I heard one last whistle, growing louder by the second. I lowered my head and started to cry. <sighs> Cancer is a bitch. She is cold and swift but relieving. I have stage four lung cancer. Every day I find myself coughing up blood into a paper towel or into my hand. I'm growing weaker with every turn of day and night. <laughs> I guess karma finally caught up to me. As a young man, I did very terrible things. When I was in the war, I killed a few people. The adrenaline I felt when I'd first killed was something almost alien to anything else. Something foreign. Something inside of me changed. Something primal. When I was discharged, I found myself craving another fix of what I'd done while I was in the service. Every now and then I would find some homeless man or a hooker on the road, and I would seize my opportunity. I usually strangled them and then disposed of the body in the pine forest behind my home. That became the light of my life. It was what got me up in the morning, and what allowed me to sleep. It was all I did. Dragging a body in a white sheet back to the woods was my normal routine from then on. After my service, I was employed at a hardware shop. Working there helped me pay my bills that stacked in the kitchen of my little house on an old rural road. While I was there, I met a young woman who clearly showed interest in me. We began talking, and every now and then, I took her out. I learned a lot about her. It turns out her last lover was an abusive drunk. When she told me, a fire began to burn in my chest, and a tickle erupted in my gut. 
Just hearing this made me excited and angry. I found out where he lived and made work of him. I buried him in the forest behind my home. I felt my passion for what I do begin to dwindle, as another passion was presented in my life. Love. We'd been dating for six months, but I still kept up my normal hobby. She never found out. Later, Tracy, my new lover, and I got married and had three kids. They grew up fine with nice paying jobs, and by this time, I'd definitely given up my hobby. <laughs> That lifestyle wasn't suitable for a father, and soon a grandfather. A few years after my grandchildren were born, I was diagnosed with lung cancer. My life started going downhill. When my grandchildren were in their teenage years, Tracy passed away from a heart attack. The little bastards I call grandchildren were more concerned about who got Tracy's possessions and the money she left over than the fact that their grandmother had just died. I felt angry, but descended into a deep state of depression. I became very senile after Tracy's death. I didn't want to see anyone, and I didn't want to put up with their shit. A few months later, my birthday came around. All up until then, my home, my sanctuary of peace and quiet, was bombarded with family and the grandchildren. They were brandishing their new phone devices and flashy clothes. They never let their gaze off them. Towards the end of the party, they told me they were going to walk into the woods and explore for a bit. I scowled at them and told them they weren't allowed to go up there. To be honest, I didn't care where those bastards went. I just wanted them out, and I didn't want them in the pines. I worried that one of them would come across an exposed skeleton. I wasn't taking a chance. I told them to go down an open trail that went away from the pines. They were displeased, but they listened. As they exited the house, I gazed out of the window. They looked back but didn't see anyone, so they quickly ran into the pines and disappeared. I cursed to myself quietly. In total, I believe I brought around 30 or so bodies up there. I slipped out of the house quietly and headed to the tool shed. I grabbed a shovel and began walking to the pines. <laughs> Looks like I'm going to have to add a few more to my count. taking a sharp gasp in disbelief and then bite down on my tongue to keep me from screaming. I really did it. I looked down at my quivering hands. They're covered in blood. Drops of red, red blood, slide through my fingers and fall on my shoes and the floor. The blood's not any special shade of red. Not crimson, and not scarlet. Just red. My arms fall limply to my sides. I killed him. It was in self-defense. I didn't want a physical relationship with him. I didn't want any kind of relationship at all. He'd barged into my home and gotten violent with me, like he always did when we argued. He'd hit me. I'd barely avoided another blow then. He'd charged at me. I'd run. I had no idea what he was going to do to me. I'd made it as far as the kitchen before he'd cornered me and caught my arm in his tight grip. Yeah. He was hurting me and screaming that he'd do far worse. I wasn't even thinking. I saw the rolling pin on the counter and I just grabbed it and swung. I heard a crack and the next thing I knew, he'd let go of my arm and was lying on the floor. As my adrenaline fades, I raise my dripping hand to the cheek into which this monstrous fist had slammed. It was just now starting to ache. It would no doubt be turning purple like the rest of my collection of bruises, some of which I could hide with my clothes, some of which I couldn't. Wait, 
Is he really dead? I slowly inch towards him and look at his crumpled form. A collapsed heap of what had been a muscle-bound churl of a man. His dark eyes are glassy and wide open with shock. And the side of his head that I hit looks like it's collapsing in on itself. It was in self-defense. He was going to hurt me again. Oh, oh, it was in self-defense, officer, I say aloud. I grin wickedly. Why would anyone believe otherwise? Oh, will my poor trembling fingers possibly be able to punch in 911? The fallen leaves dance and chase each other through the shadows of tombstones. The rustle reminds me of children's laughter. Perhaps it is laughter, he mused. They were free of the tree that had held them enslaved. Free now to fly on the winds that teased them all summer. I caught a movement that was neither leaf nor shadow, that walked into a moonlight clearing. Such a fragile figure, slender and graceful, a willow among sturdy oaks, squat apples and lumbering pines that comprised most of humanity. I know, even though the creature was too far away, that the hair bound so tight beneath the jacket's hood is the color of old gold. The eyes are silver gray, the skin a pale, smooth ivory. The creature that moves so silently through the dancing leaves and shifting shadows is a treasure I crave with an intensity that sometimes makes me angry. This creature is mine, but a treasure I take more pleasure in watching than taking for the moment. How many nights have I stood watch over this night traveller as it wound its way through the cemetery? How many nights have I watched the weary creature stop and rest? The scent of grease and burnt food on the clothing is a sickening counterpoint to the rose and sandalwood of the smooth skin. How? Many times have I stood unseen, so close I can hear the soft breath and fluttering heart. How many times have I let this sweet delight rise and walk away? One night, I won't let it walk away. He frowned as the creature stumbled. <laughs> Exhaustion, he surmised. It happens sometimes. Barely halfway across, the weary creature stopped and sat down on a cold stone bench. A change from its normal behavior. Always before, it had stopped beneath the singing tree, an ancient oak filled with wind chimes by mourners. I frowned and moved silently through the shadows, till I stood mere feet behind the slumped form. I listened to the heart that beat far too fast and hard, the breath that was a ragged draw. Illness. Why did it strike these frail creatures so quickly? Still, my sweet diversion is young. Illness will be thrown off soon. And soon it will be old enough to claim forever. The moon grew full and waned following its own time. The dark nights came and went, but no footsteps broke the silence of the stone garden, save mine. I had gone from sorrow, to anger, to fear. Why had I never followed the golden creature to its home, so I would know where to start looking for it? Even the leaves had fled, leaving the ground bare until the snow had taken pity and tucked it into a feathery quilt of pristine white. It was on an icy cold night that the moon broke from the clouds and sparkled against the snow. There it showed the slow, progress of a too thin figure. I leapt from my perch with a strangely eager heart, but then saw the slow, staggering movements. It could not be my lost creature. The body was rail thin, the hair lank, and yet sandalwood and roses teased me beneath the sour sweat of fever. I had to know for sure. I followed carelessly, he could afford to, 
The shambling creature was focused upon its path and nothing else. Sheer strength of will kept the feet plodding their slow path until they came to the singing tree. The faint wind sent the chimes hidden high above in the tree branches, dancing into a slow and mournful melody. The head looked up and the hood fell away. Oh, my heart nearly broke. What had happened to my sweet face treasure? When had it grown so pale and feeble? The golden hair was dulled, the eyes sunken, the ivory skin flushed, the grace torn away by a body struggling to survive. My little wandering prize, my small amusement, my delight, was soon to be a hollow shell. <sighs> Such was always the case with these creatures. The graveyard was proof of that. But this creature was mine. I would not allow it to die. She curled up at the base of the tree. She never knew she was being watched. This was her final night. Some primal instinct had told her, and so she had struggled to come to the Garden of Silence. She had never feared this place. Always it had welcomed her into its calm embrace. She sighed, closing her eyes, listening to the soft chimes. So very tired now. She didn't feel the arms that so gently embraced her, nor the piercing fangs at her throat. There was no fight for the life that was falling too swiftly to catch. Instead, she stepped out of the cocoon of flesh and spread her wings. Freedom and light, welcoming another angel home as a creature of darkness wept crimson tears, berating himself for not capturing his treasure when there had been time. Hey there. Thank you so much for taking the time to drop by and listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me. I put a lot of time and effort into making these videos, so it's nice to know that there's someone out there listening. Do me a little favor, would you? Click that like button, leave a comment, and if you really feel like it, why not subscribe too? Okay, happy tales everyone. See you soon.